These playoffs honestly turned out close to what I expected. A few teams at the top surrounded by frauds and those punching above their weight. Even then, any given Sunday had us hope that someone could rise from the ashes, but not really this year. Too many variables and injuries for anyone to pounce. Those that didn't make it further, I'm sorry, but it's time to read your epitaph. What could have been? That's the only thing I'm thinking after this one. Buffalo was oddly off throughout this match. They were trying to hand Miami a hilariously embarrassing loss at home. With all the narratives and emotion in the world, yet they still couldn't capitalize. They were too battered by injury on the offensive front. Even with the lead in the second half, the Bills escaped themselves. It's a damn shame, but it was a near impossible task with Skylar Thompson under center. If the Dolphins have a healthy Tua, they probably win this one. Which makes this season feel lost. So much hope at the beginning of the year only to have it all fall apart at the worst possible time. Josh Boyer's defense was part of the problem. And he's been canned. Just hope Tua doesn't have any lingering effects from those concussions. If he does, your ass is in the jackpot. It's one thing to be without your best weapon on the field of play. It's another entirely to be closer to victory than you ever expected yet still come up short. There's a dignity in being slaughtered. You don't get your hopes up. You acknowledge you were completely outmatched and move on. But when you're competitive, dare I say the better team, it's a brutal way to go out. The Ravens chant nevermore and croaked like Poe in an alleyway. What did you think the problem was? It was the offense. Like it has been for the past two months. This team wasn't to be trusted. And they confirmed it with a QB sneak at the two yard line that backfired horrifically. Was that imitation Lamar going rogue? Whatever it is, J.K. Dobbins is the next in a long line of Baltimore skill players that are living. As a decade of pain continues, prepare for the biggest offseason in franchise history. It won't involve you, Greg Roman. Quoth the Ravens. There's the door. The Chargers charged so hard that it outchargers any chargering past. If I were them, I would pray to the Lord for forgiveness, for they have committed the ultimate sins. Getting endless opportunities from T-Law imploding under the bright lights. A five turnover differential, all in the first half. A 27 point lead in the second quarter. I always felt the Chargers were escaping their own incompetence all season, but this is something different. This is their magnum opus. Years of horrifying self-inflicted failure pale in comparison to the outright larceny committed on whatever's left of their fan base. It was special. Something Falcons and Texans-esque. They checked down Joe Lombardi's pink slip, but they should have gone further. You don't recover from this kind of loss. You have to wipe it clean. Keeping Brandon Staley around proves that this franchise is forfeit. Just watch the same shit happen next year. If only games were played for 30 minutes, right, Brandon? Son of a bitch, you just blew it! I'll give them credit for being one of the rare seven seats that can keep up in the pity playoff invitational. For about three quarters. They kept up with the gun show. And not many can with San Francisco. We all wondered if we were going to laugh heartily in Santa Clara, but then... Yeah. Total collapse where the entire team at the blue screen of death. Even in the face of Brock not having the purtiest game, Seattle ran out of gas and it showed. Hell of a season, though. There wasn't much to expect from this team, and they exceeded all goals and then some. Can't shit on them for what they did. Even with forgetting how to play football in the fourth quarter. Seahawks, you'll be fine. Put some used chewing gum in the leaks and call it a day. I couldn't shake the thought of Tampa Bay somehow bullshitting to a win against Dallas. Too many elements at play. But that's why we call the playoffs a clean slate. It shows us how terrible the Bucks were this season. Dallas brought their A game and put this pathetic team to bed. It was a mercy kill if you were to ask me. Tampa somehow took their awful play, horrifyingly bad offense and clueless coaching and made it even worse. Tom Brady did his best imitation of 2015 Peyton Manning behind a running game that predictably didn't do shit. The Cowboys terrorized their opponents so badly that it could be deemed a glorified bye week. Byron Leftwich may regret not taking the Jags job, but Tom Bowles will continue to have Dick LeBeau syndrome. Excellent coordinator, terrible head coach. Welcome back to hell, Bucks. It's gonna be a long free fall as Brady becomes a Raider. Oh, so Tom Brady's retiring again? Oh. Great. I'm not being fooled by this one again. I'm not mentioning a comment on this until he's dead and buried in the ground. I learned my lesson from last year. I still want him to be a Raider though, it'd be hilarious. A former Vikings coach said it best. They are who we thought they were. Frauds. 
A glorified 9-win team that ended up shooting well above their pay grade and finally got called out for it. Minnesota should have learned to fortify its defenses. When going up against the Giants, it felt like they could do nothing to stop them. You can't look at how poorly they played and tell me this was a quality football team. Ed Donatel butchery all season. Firing him afterwards is too late. High-end talent isn't enough to bail out whatever that was. And it was painful. Daniel Jones and Saquon had a field day. And you gave New York the worst thing you could have offered. Legitimate hope. Kirk Cousins may have had a good game, but his legacy in Minnesota is set in stone. A three-yard check down on a fourth and eight. Perpetually coming up short. The story of the Kirk era. It's a shame he's going to be Bill Buckner and he doesn't deserve it, but that's how the human brain works. Despite this being a winnable game, the Jags should feel no shame for the season they had. Going from shag clown to clowning LA's fail son is impressive all its own. But even then, they weren't ready for a deep push. Despite everything given to them by the Chiefs to win. Despite Patrick Mahomes being injected with enough Toradol to knock out an elephant. Despite KC's defense being as suspect as Carmen goddamn San Diego, Jacksonville couldn't capitalize. Any chances they had to win were squandered. Opportunities not converted. Fumbled away like Jamal Agnew in the red zone. Alas, all you can ask is what could have been. Watching Chiefs fans squirm would have been an outstanding sight. But once again, Duvall was undercooked. But what a future you seem to have. A legitimate franchise QB manning the helm to hopefully catapult the Jags back to contending status. It's a beautiful thing. The only downside I can really think of is being stuck with Trent Baalke for the next five years. To be fair, that may be a brutal punishment all its own. I tried to ignore how awful they looked against the Dolphins. I overlooked a ton of red flags that popped up about this team over the year. The narratives were just too good. A snow game in Buffalo, strong favorites against Cincy, Damar Hamlin in attendance. The Bills made sure it was a storybook ending. The tale was Rumpelstiltskin. The Emperor is without clothes. Buffalo, with everything trending in their favor, laid a massive egg. What doesn't frustrate me is the inconsistent offense, nor the persistence on Zone D, nor being outclassed in every facet. It's that this was supposed to be the year. All the talk about how Buffalo got screwed over by a coin. Everyone proclaiming you to be a Super Bowl favorite, myself included. The big signing of Von Miller. To be fair, I don't know if a healthy Von would have helped. The Bengals were just the better team. And I honestly have no idea what you do if you're the Bills. This was your best shot, and you muffed it. Overused like Josh Allen on offense. He is their crutch. And until let go, they are doomed to the same fate over and over. Nobody circles the wagons of futility like the Buffalo Bills. This outcome shouldn't be surprising. The Giants were playing way over their heads all season. Marching into Philly was their death sentence. Merely being chucked into a gladiator pit to be slaughtered by Eagles. They were a far superior class of team and it showed all game long. Philly forced Daniel Jones to beat them with his arm. And he just can't do it. The G-Men didn't stand a chance from the opening kickoff. And it was a slow and painful death for 60 minutes. It's a damn good season for a team that needed it, but this outcome leaves them with more questions than answers if you believe it. New York has a fascinating offseason coming up. What do you do with Danny and Saquon? Keep one, both, or neither? Does management feel that this season was a fluke, or do they have potential for something more? There are arguments either way, and I trust Shane and Dable to guide them down the right path. They've earned it after this. Congratulations, your team still can't make it past the second round of the playoffs. It's the greatest tradition in the NFL world. One that truly allows Dallas to earn the title of America's team. The nation celebrates when they're eliminated. Best of all, it was in a game that the Cowboys could have easily won. Their defense played valiantly throughout. But all it did was reinforce so many narratives about Dallas that you could mistake it for the 80s TV show. Predictable follies abound. Defensive players holding their ground for the offense to do whatever the hell it was pretending to attempt. Dak Prescott knew this was a legacy-defining game, yet fell apart when it mattered. Kind of like the Cowboys themselves, if you think about it. Any situation where you need your absolute best, Dallas falters. And everyone knows nothing's going to change. More of the same old things are going to keep popping up in the future. Which includes the most hilarious play to end a game since Dak running a QB sneak up the middle with no timeouts. No, he's not the Blacker Cousins. That comparison's insulting to Kirk. The gods have a cruel sense of humor. They'll build up teams and give them a false sense of confidence only to humiliate them in big moments. 
I had a feeling this was gonna happen to Cincy. They were getting way too cocky, talking so much shit that no one in their right mind could back up. Eli Apple and Mike Hilton running their mouths, Burrowhead Stadium, the fucking mayor of Cincinnati issuing a paternity test for Mahomes? You're just asking for trouble. A healthy serving of humble pie must be delivered by a man with one healthy leg. I want to say one thing. The ref ball was especially heinous. An incredibly fucky game that felt manipulated as hell. Even then, the refs weren't the main reason the Bengals lost. They did this to themselves. A backup offensive line hurt them at the worst moments. Burrow chucking arm punts on third and short. And the coup de grace a back-breaking 15-yard penalty sending the Chiefs to field goal range. Shades of the 2016 wildcard game. Brutality in slow motion. Victory within grasp, yet manages to slip away. Forced to swallow a pill of bitter regret. It's the pain of the postseason. And the cost of glory. A true shame. Injuries have destroyed the Niners in three of the last five seasons. In the ultimate curse, it happened again. San Francisco was decimated by forces beyond their control. Losing two QBs is hard enough, but the third time was finally the charm. Big Cock Brock was cut down by a fucked elbow. Having no choice, they were forced to chuck the eternal journeyman Josh Johnson out to play the biggest game of his life. Before he was also knocked out of the game. If you're forced to rely on a Brock that can't throw a football more than three yards, you're done. The Ron Trails used this meat for a cheesesteak stand. Maybe those will show as much unnecessary fight as the Niners did. Horrifically undisciplined. Even if the Eagles got a ton of breaks, they were winning this one easily regardless. It was a funeral, and Kyle Shanahan is Sisyphus, continually pushing the ball to a star QB on top of the hill only for it to get hurt and fall off the other side. Such a terrible fate. Pray for his children. These playoffs have played out as I've expected. A handful of good teams surrounded by shit. Two of the best have made it here, and the AFC is being represented by a common one. Time is a circle. No matter what everyone fancies about the league and its teams, the same outcomes tend to occur over and over again. We may speak of the rivals ready to take the Chiefs off their pedestal, the Chargers and their talented offense, the Broncos bringing in Russell Wilson in a huge move, the Raiders managing to exist, not to mention Buffalo and their revenge tour were gearing up to finally exhume their demons. Kansas City was getting cocky. Their haughtiness cost them the last few seasons. Super Bowl against Tampa Bay where they were crushed by hydraulic press. Don't forget last year where they went out to a sizable lead against the Bengals only to be one-upped. The King was seemingly on his last breath. Facing a deep cap crunch, losing one of their best offensive weapons in Tyreek Hill via trade. You'd think the age of the Chiefs would be over, right? Not really. When you aim for the King, you best not miss. While inherently flawed, there are still weapons out the wazoo. And with Patrick Mahomes under center, they will always have a chance at greatness. Even on one leg, he will make magic happen. All the while, every broadcaster takes turns filleting him during games. There is some justification to it. He's the new face of football, you could argue. A man who enjoys ketchup on steak and driving a stake through the heart of his enemies. This includes Cincinnati. Oh, what a brutal sight that was to witness. The weapons that flank him are newer faces, but still threats nonetheless. There is a number 10 similar to Tyreek, but don't be fooled. That's merely Isaiah Pacheco, who's blossomed into a playmaker in his own right. Not bad for a seventh round rookie. Jerk McKinnon is still kicking as a specialist in the backfield, and staying healthy as well. At wideout, it's a changed group. McCole Hardman's still here, but there's no real headliner of the bunch. Weapons are plenty, however. The main ones being offseason pickups in Juju Smith Schuster and Marquez Valdez Scantling. Not to mention Kadarius Tony. whenever he's healthy. They're allowed to be free because another main piece is still around. Travis Kelsey. Wherever he is, you must be wary. He will punish defenses no matter what they do. Opposing fans throughout the world will scream why nobody's covering Kelsey. Well, that's because he's like Teflon. Nothing sticks. Not to mention that strong offensive line led by Creed Humphrey and Orlando Brown. It's a deadly weapon all its own. And they're not down to back up tackles this time around. The defensive line is the catalyst for all hope on that end. Frank Clark and Chris Jones are the cornerstones of it. Jones has been a beast, but Clark has been disappointing this season. George Karloftis and Carlos Dunlap are other formidable weapons on this front. All teams have a weakness, however. 
and this one's flaws in pass protection. It's one of the worst in the league. And despite all that Willie Gay and Nick Bolton do, it can't hide the fact that their secondary is young and inexperienced. They lost Javarius Ward in the Honey Badger in free agency last offseason, and Legereus Sneed suffered injury in the game against Cincy. So if he's not healthy, they'll have to rely on Jalen Watson, Trent McDuffie, Justin Reed, and Juan Thornhill to man the fort. Not exactly striking the most fear into defenses. You shouldn't scoff at them, however. Kansas City is in a position where it does its best. Hungry. Looking to upend those that doubt them. We made that mistake earlier, and we've suffered the consequences for it. The Chiefs will be going to their third Super Bowl in four years. As that happens, Andy Reid eats the doubters of this team in the form of a delicious cheeseburger. This will be his fourth trip to the big game, and perhaps his second ring in the process. To get that, however, he'll have to go up against a foe he knows very, very well. This is one of the few times where we will willingly go back to 2020. It was a year of hell, especially for the Eagles. To the glory of every division rival in the NFC East, Philly was terrible. Carson Wentz collapsing under the weight of Doug Peterson and his own propensity for hero ball. Years upon years of drafting fuck-ups. A flawed roster with next to no hope on the way. Howie Roseman about to be deservedly roasted on an open fire. Just under three years after a Super Bowl win, they were relegated to accusations of tanking in their final game against Washington. After such a disaster, things needed to change. Peterson was cast into the abyss for both losing the plot and losing a power struggle. Things looking mighty bleak for the Eagles, right? A bunch of baffling moves would usually signal the doom of all involved. However, Philly chose to unleash their deadliest weapon, a conversion to Satanism. Delving into the dark arts, Roseman found ways to take a terrible situation and save it from falling into a precipice. I would advise against making draft day trades with him. They tend to usually work out in Philly's favor. A quarterback he's found his prize. Many questioned him drafting Jalen Hurts. He was cast off from Alabama. You have Carson Wentz. His upside at the NFL level is rather limited. That was until this year. In 2022, he burst from the doldrums to become one of the upper tier QBs in the league. A weapon with a surprisingly accurate and potent arm. A man blessed with maneuverability and finesse in his feet. A true dual threat option. And oh, the weapons he has to choose from. Try running back, where he not only has Miles Sanders, but the spiritual successor to Darren Sproles in Boston Scott, and a third formidable option in Kenneth Gainwell. Try tight end, where Dallas Goddard has taken the reins from a traded Zach Ertz to become an ever-important safety valve for Hertz. But wide receiver, that's where they really shine. Philly finally hit on a drafted wideout. I know, it's stunning. Jalen Rieger and J.J. Ortega Whiteside busted so Devontae Smith could fly and catch incredible passes and become one of the best wide receivers in the game. He doesn't get enough attention. You know why? Go back to draft time. Jacksonville breaking the bank for Christian Kirk opened up an opportunity. A legitimate headliner was ripe for the taking. And Philly refused to look a gift horse in the mouth. A.J. Brown, it's time for you and your wallet to shine like gangbusters. The man that helps Philly's offense become a dynamo. I have to give credit to that offensive line as well. One of the best units in the game, bar none. Even with an injured Lane Johnson at right tackle. By the way, has anyone mentioned that Jason Kelsey is Travis Kelsey's brother yet? Are you tired of hearing about it? Good, because here's at least 50 more statements as such. Here are a hundred statements on how loaded their defensive line and edge rushers are. Four men with at least 10 sacks. Freshly paid Hassan Reddick, Josh Sweat, Javon Hargrave, longtime vet Brendan Graham. Fletcher Cox is still kicking ass as a three tech. Not to mention they just drafted an absolute beast in Jordan Davis when he's healthy. They've loaded up with vets in an all in push. Ndamukong Su, Linval Joseph, Robert Quinn. Quinn's barely played. It's a threat all its own. At linebacker T.J. Edwards and Chargers refugee Kaiser White man the fort, but in the secondary, it's another all-in push. Over the past few years, trades and acquisitions for the likes of Big Play Slay, James Bradbury, and Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. Not to mention homegrown talents like Avante Maddox and Marcus Epps. Thanks for Epps, Minnesota. Philly is no longer the Rocky Balboa clone they were the last time they were here. They're a legitimate juggernaut. A team that's crushed nearly everyone that stood in their path. 
It may have been a ridiculously easy road to get back here, but the road still must be traveled regardless. It's also a chance of revenge against the man that was a symbol for past failures in Andy Reid. Him and Donovan McNabb were enemies of the state for a long time. And while both Reed and the team have experienced success since parting ways, revenge is always desired. So what'll it be moving forward? A Kansas City barbecue or a Philadelphia nightmare? Only one way to find out. Any given Sunday is what everyone says. We've seen it happen over and over throughout the regular season, but these playoffs have been rather predictable. Although I kind of expected it. To me, Kansas City's secondary is just too weak to make a huge difference against Philly's passing attack. Their defensive line must get pressure to have any chance. I don't know if they can here. Cincy's O-line was weakened, but Philly's is still formidable. By that alone, I'm going with the Eagles to win. Is it really a jinx? All I know is that we'll be so tired of the storylines, we'll be dying for the game to start.